Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I need to go ahead and put the Tennyson warning into our chat so you can go ahead and look at that language. It lets you know what Microsoft Teams collects in the background. And we have one hour together today to discuss the Minnesota Dual Training Grant for the legal cannabis industry. And so I'm going to go ahead and sh share our um, PowerPoint presentation for everyone and we can get started. Okay, awesome. Well, again, welcome. Um, this is a one hour workshop that is going to go through eligibility and application steps for the dual training grant legal cannabis industry request for proposal. We can start off with some introductions. My name is Jacqueline Mall-Sletton. I am an assistant manager for our grants and workforce initiatives department at the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. And my colleague Grace can go ahead and introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grace Ferdinand, and I am the program administrator um, or a program administrator at the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, and um, I will pass it over to DLI. Kathleen. Yeah, thanks, Grace. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathleen Gordon. I um, and work at the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. I'm a program pipeline program consultant, and I will hand it over to Eric. Thanks, Kathleen. I am one of the three uh, dual training pipeline consultants that go out to uh, industry and and work with quite, quite any questions you have as far as applying for a grant or just setting up some type of a uh, workforce program. And then I'll turn it over to the last one, Maddie. Hi, everyone. Maddie Martini, also a dual training pipeline consultant with a crying baby in the house, so I apologize if you hear anything. But for transportation and IT, I am uh, your consultant, and I'll hand it back over to Jacqueline. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. So our agenda um, for the next hour, so we are going to show you the websites that you will utilize through the proposal process, give you some pieces about the grant overview, where it kind of comes from, that funding availability for this year, and then the really important piece that we'll delve into is um, eligibility, and then how the selection criteria and process works, any competitive priorities and collaboration for the proposal. And then we do want to show you the online submission process and those screens, how you register in that system and go through those application screens. And we'll round everything out with grantee planning. If you have any questions as we go through these steps, please go ahead, enter them into that chat feature. Grace and I are going to be looking at that. We'll answer them either in the chat right there or we'll go live and um, answer those questions. And at the very end, anybody that would like to ask questions is more than welcome to unmute themselves and go ahead and ask. So for navigating websites, so there's two different agencies that are overseeing the programming and the grant, and so we do have um, website links for both of them. The first is over at the Department of Labor and Industry side. So these are all the different types of links that will be really helpful to inform your dual training program as you are creating it and as you are applying for the grant. And then these are going to be the websites that are specific to the grant itself and actually applying online. And we have that online submission um, process link in here as well. We will be, once this session is done, we are going to have this being recorded. It's going to be posted online. In addition to all of these slides will also be posted online. So you'll be able to quickly grab those links if you don't already have them. Grant overview, just want to give you some high level information about the history of this grant. So in 2014, the Minnesota legislature actually established um, a dual training project over at the Department of Labor and Industry. Over that, the years, the project has actually grown to a fully sustainable program, and we call it today Minnesota Dual Training Pipeline. And that is where Kathleen, Eric, and Maddie are. And then a year later in 2015, the Minnesota legislature established the dual training grant as a funding resource to help support those employers as they're getting those dual training programs off the ground. And that is where myself and Grace are located. And really recently in 2023, the Minnesota legislature 
legislature decided to establish the dual training grant legal cannabis industry. So this is the dual training grant, but just specific for the legal cannabis industry. So it is a competitive grant program that is ran completely separate from the first established dual training grant. However, it utilizes and um, refers back to a majority of the language in the dual training grant. So that's why it's important to know how all of these pieces link together. What does it mean when we keep talking about dual training? What are those components? So dual training has two components in order to be a real true dual training program. You need to have formal related instruction, that piece where individuals are learning the fundamental skills and the theory behind it. And then that is being paired with structured on the job training. And that on the job training is housed with the employer. So the employer is working with their employee, knowing that they're learning this formal instruction with this outside entity. And then they're tailoring those on the job training plans so they can practice those skills and see how they at their company actually apply those skills. So as I was um, talking earlier, we do have two agencies that are very much involved in this work. The Minnesota Dual Training Pipeline, what is their, what is their role and the pieces um, that they do? So they um, work directly with those employers and they host industry forums where they are meeting with employers in the industry to learn about the industry that will inform and direct their work. They also facilitate competency councils where they are getting more in detail about these very specific skills, making sure when they create competency models, that it is a reflection of what the employers have said these employees need these skills. And then they also do um, dual training consulting. So they are more than happy to be meeting with employers, um, seeing what their workforce needs are, working through strategies, um, creating plans with those employers one on one. The competency models that um, the Minnesota Dual Training Pipeline team creates and works with employers on creating, this is a visual of the top part of what those competency models look like. These competency models are really important for applying for the dual training grant because the types of skills that are written into these models do need to be written into the request for proposal. When you look at these competency models at the very top of the model, the OCUS patient specific competencies, these are the types of skills that would typically be learned through on the job training tasks. There's also to the left of that box in employer specific requirements, and that is always left um, open or blank on purpose because we know that some employers have really specific skills that they need to teach through on the job training, and that's absolutely okay. The other two tiers below it industry sector and industry wide um, competencies. Those are the types of skills that one would typically learn through the related instruction. So that formal training provider should be touching on those pieces. And so therefore, when you're creating a dual training program, you want to make sure that you highlight these types of skills, whether it's on the on the job training side or the related instruction side. And you don't have to highlight all of the skills. This is just a guide to get employers started as they're developing their plans. So then what is the role of the team at the Office of Higher Ed for the grant specifically? So Grace and I, we are in charge of creating, releasing, and managing the request for proposal. We go ahead and determine and announce grant awards. We man set up and manage all grant contracts. We process the reimbursement requests, any of those invoices that come to us to be paid. We provide various training and support as it relates specifically just to the grant. We conduct monitoring visits and site visits, and we collect and analyze um, annual report data and publish an annual report each year to the Minnesota legislature. Funding availability for this request for proposal. This is the very first request for a proposal. So the dual training grant that was um, established back in 2015, that is actually went through its 13th request for proposal. And this for the legal cannabis industry, this is the very first that is being released. 
and um, we have one million eight hundred and eighty dollars available this year and this type of funding does either if it's unutilized during a request for a proposal it does either roll forward into the next or it does at times roll forward actually into the original dual training grant and with the um, original dual training grant the employers in the legal cannabis industry are also welcome to apply for that grant as well. So there are two different funding sources that employers in the legal cannabis industry are eligible to apply for. The funding availability, um, the proposal period, it opened on June 26th and it will be closing on July 22nd. So it's a very quick turnaround for this request for proposal. The grant period is August 2024 through August of 2025. So we anticipate that contracts will be signed and effective by the end of August in order for employees or dual trainees to begin their programs. We have two different budget categories that happen within this funding source. The very first is related instruction. That's that formal training with a training provider, what that training provider would be charging for things like tuition, fees, required books, required materials. And um, an applicant can apply for up to $150,000. If the applicant is considered a large employer, and that would mean that they had annual gross revenue that exceeded 25 million in the 2023 calendar year, they are required to contribute 25%. So they need to pay for 25% of that related instruction costs. We do have a cap on that though. So the cap is $2,000 per trainee. And then the dual trainee themselves, that employee that's participating in the program during this grant period for the one year, they do also have a maximum. So they can only benefit for up to $6,000 um, through the actual grant itself. And then the budget, cat there's a second budget category, and that is our trainee support costs. A good way of thinking of trainee support costs is it is a separate bucket of funding that an employer has and they have a bit more flexibility with it. So when they're applying for it, the maximum that they can apply for is 10% of their related instruction amount. So if they would go ahead and say, you know, we want a related instruction at 150,000, we want to go for the max, then their trainee support, the maximum they could request is 15,000. So it's 10% of. Now with trainee support costs though, there is no match requirement. So the actual applicant, grantee, employer, uh, they actually do not need to match those funds. And that trainee support cost funds, it can uh, um, assist with items that are related to the related instruction side, like transportation, mileage, lodging, meals, tutoring service, translation, interpreter, accessibility services. Those extra pieces that one of your employees may need additional assistance with to be successful in their related instruction. And then there is no dual trainee maximum on that part. So although you would identify the trainee in which is benefiting from those funds, it would not impact that trainee's annual or even their lifetime maximums through the grant. With funding availability, um, I just want to reiterate that the maximum is $6,000 for the grant period for the year for your um, trainee themselves to benefit from. And then if a trainee decides to continue on, it is a maximum of $24,000 in a lifetime. Now, an employer does need to apply for the grant each year. It's not a grant that automatically renews if you have a trainee that's continuing. However, these um, grantees who do apply again and have trainees continuing, they do receive priority and we'll talk about that a bit in upcoming slides. Wonderful, we are gonna move over to the eligibility piece. I'm gonna have Grace go through those steps with you. Um, before Grace starts, I just wanna make sure that you are well aware that please read that request for proposal document that is on the website, on the Office of Higher Ed's website because we are gonna go through these eligibility pieces quite quickly, but everything is really detailed in that request for proposal. So we don't want you to miss any of those additional details that are really important for your proposal. So I'll turn it over to Grace and you can begin on eligibility. 
Wonderful. Thanks, Jacqueline. So as Jacqueline said, this will be a lot of this is outlined in that request for proposal, but we're also going to be providing you with these slides as well. And so as we go through, you're going to see a lot of different links. I'm not going to take the time to go click click on every one of those, but it's a resource for you as we go through. So there are seven eligibility components um, that we are going to talk through today. Industries and occupations, applicant, uh, dual trainee related instruction, industry recognized degree certificate and credential, related instruction training provider, and on the job training. Um, really important to remember, Jacqueline, I just gone over um, some of the deadlines here. And July 22nd, since that is the last day of the proposal window, um, after that date, you cannot add any additional industries, occupation, employer partnering, um, all of that has to be finalized by July 22nd. Okay, so there are a lot of different industries that we work with with dual training. Of course, today we're looking at legal can the legal ca cannabis industry, but if you were um, to go to, to, to this link here, it actually shows that there are two um, job positions, the cultivation supervisor and laboratory technician. However, we also know that the cannabis industry may also touch on a variety of other industries. So the position where you may want to set up dual training, maybe it falls under agriculture or advancement manufacturing. And so when you're applying for the grant, make sure that you are re really thinking about the position and where it may fall within each of the industries. So to be an eligible applicant, uh, the applicant must meet all of the following. They must be a cannabis employer or organization of cannabis employers in which the cannabis employer operates within the cannabis industry, is a registered medical cannabis manufacturer, tribal sovereign nation, or licensed cannabis business and aligns with one of the applicant classifications of business, entity, nonprofit organization, political subdivision, state of Minnesota, or tribal sovereign nation. Okay, so then you also would need to either have or will have a dual training program, and employer will employ an eligible trainee. Now, your trainees, they do need to be employed um, with your company in order to be an eligible trainee. And we'll talk about that a little bit here in a second. Um, the eligible applicant also um, needs to enter into agreement with a related instruction training provider. And we'll also talk about that in, in a moment, what qualifies as an eligible um, tra training provider. And then if your annual gross revenue exceeds 25 million in the previous calendar year, we do require that 25% match of related instruction costs. And as Jacqueline stated, there are two separate areas, um, the trainee support costs and the related instruction costs. It's the related instruction cost that has that 25% match and that those training support costs do not require a match. So the maximum 25% contribution um, for the instruction for the match is 2,000 per dual trainee. And wages and or in-kind contribution cannot be considered as part of that 25%. So this is our first year uh, of dual training grant legal cannabis. So if a current and for the following years prior dual training grant um, legal cannabis recipient, they must be in good standing on all grant requirements. If they are a current or prior recipient of any other Minnesota state grant programs, they must be in good standing on all grant requirements. Fantastic. And one thing I wanted to jump in before we go to the next eligibility slide is, on the left side where it talks about the eligible applicant, we didn't bold 
licensed cannabis business um, because at this time the licensing is not finalized through the Minnesota Office of Cannabis Management. So we are acknowledging that in the future licensed cannabis businesses will definitely be eligible to apply for this grant just at this time since that is not fully established yet only the registered medical cannabis manufacturers and tribal sovereign nations will be able to apply during this first request for proposal. So continuing on with the eligible applicant, um, some examples of organization of cannabis employers primarily include chambers of commerce, industry associations, and workforce development organization. So that organization would represent their cannabis employer partners and be responsible for meeting all grant requirements. Um, that this on this slide is just some good additional information for you to refer to as you are going through the request for proposal and you'll be sent this as well. Um, so next we're going to move into eligible dual trainee. So your your actual employee, um, an eligible dual trainee must meet the following. Uh, they are employed, so they are either a new hire or incumbent worker. So this grant money is not meant to um, be for pr prospective um, employees. They must be employed as a new hire or incumbent workers um, by an eligible applicant or employer partnering with the eligible applicant. They must physically work at a permanent work location within Minnesota. So that means that if your company maybe is based out of North Dakota, the trainee may still be eligible if their permanent work location is right in Minnesota. Um, the reverse of that is if you are a Minnesota-based company, but if the permanent work location for this trainee maybe is in Wisconsin, then they would not be eligible because their work location must be within the state of Minnesota. Um, and the trainee has not already attained competency standards specific to the applica application prior to the, commence the commencement of training. And they must be on within a dual training program that leads to an eligible industry recognized degree, certificate, or credential upon completion of the dual training program. Wonderful. And one more thing I'd like to add for the eligible dual trainees. This program is often used as a recruitment um, mechanism. And so during the time of the proposal submission, you may not know who these individuals are, or you may have not have hired them yet. I will say, though, because of the short turnaround and fall term courses beginning at the end of August, the fall semester may be a little difficult to recruit brand new hires for, but if you are awarded and you have a program that maybe starts in spring term, like January of 2025, you could utilize this funding then to spend a few months recruiting, and then maybe they could start a program in spring as well. So there's a lot of different possibilities on the timing of the hiring. The most important thing is to get a contract um, effective and in place, so then you can make sure your trainee can start. And this slide also um, goes a little bit over what Jacqueline was identifying as well. The dual trainee's employment cannot be contingent upon completion of the dual training program. Um, and the information that would identify a dual trainee should not be included in the proposal process, like name, um, any personal identifiers, those do not put those into uh, the proposal. And then Eligible related instruction. So this is where, um, in addition to the on, on the job training, which we'll talk about in just a little bit here, um, this is going to be the related instruction. So these are two separate sides of this grant. So the related instruction often comes through a higher education source. Um, and the related instruction is an opportunity for the dual trainees to learn the fundamentals of occupations through formal training from a training provider. Um, an eligible related instruction program must meet all of the following. So they have to 
um, they have to be provided by an eligible training provider and meet one or more identified competency standards. Uh, they need to be, for the majority of the time, they need to be instructor led. And it must result again in the dual trainee receiving an eligible industry recognized degree, certificate, or credential. So, in, so eligible relay instruction may be facilitated through in person or virtual modes, but within those mo modes, a qualified instructor employed or contracted by the eligible training provider must be delivering the content for a majority of the related instruction. Um, so OHI, let's see, a related instruction program that is self-paced or has an instructor available only for support is not eligible for the dual training grant funds. So there's a lot of online uh, training programs that maybe just provide students with the information for them to read through and then they're tested on it. Um, and then the instructors are only there as a support person those are not eligible for dual training grant funds. So the instructor does need to be setting up basically synchronous meetings um, and, and lectures and different pieces so that they are instructor led. And then this part's very important as well. Eligible industry recognized degree, certificate or credential. What does this mean? An eligible industry um, they need to offer certificates or diplomas or degrees issued by the post the post secondary institution. So from that training provider, um, or it needs to be a registered apprenticeship with certifications or certificates, occupational license or registrations, um, certifications issued by or recognized by industry or professional associations, other certif certifications as approved by the commissioner. And degree certificates and credentials must be tangible. They have to be able to be transferable and recognized by the industry or professional association on a universal level. Um, and the certificate of completion programs, continuing education credits, individual courses, and professional development training programs are not eligible for dual training grant funds. So these are a couple additional resources for you as well as you kind of explore and navigate um, and applying or, pre or um, completing the request for proposal. Um, so they must be able to legally operate legally in Minnesota by meeting one of the following standards. So the instruction training provider uh, must be either operated by the Board of Trustees for the Minnesota State Colleges and University System, so that's MinState, or the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota, so any of the U of M campuses, uh, re or registered as a post-secondary institution by the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. Again, you can click on these links and they'll bring you out to a comprehensive list. And then also, um, they may be a like, they may be licensed as a post-secondary institution by the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, or they're exempt, exempt from registration and licensure provisions as approved by the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. So um, a registered school, degree-granting religious schools, SARA schools, licensed schools, and non-degree religious schools. And then, so this is to expand a little bit more on that exemption. Uh, training providers will validate exemption certificates, do not need to take further action. However, training provider, providers who do have a valid exemption certificates and who may be exempt from licensing provisions are required to obtain uh, an application for exemption by contacting our office, the Missile Office of Higher Education, institutional licensure and registration. And so that's Kate's information here. And to continue uh, for the eligible related instruction training provider, uh, these are two avenues that you can explore the related instruction training providers. And then I'm going to turn this over if one of our DLI partners wouldn't mind discussing on the job training. Uh, 
Uh, sure. This is Kathleen. And um, so we um, we always want to, um, you know, meet with um, employers who want to set up a dual training program and discuss with them their on-the-job training. One of the main things that you want to think about is um, who will be in charge of your on-the-job training or leading your on-the-job training. And we always say it might not be the person who has been there the longest, but someone who has been there a long enough time to have mastered the skills, um, but still is interested in building relationships with these folks so that they have friends at work. Um, the main, I'd say the main um, uh, mode of on-the-job training that we see employers use is probably job shadowing and second being mentorship. Um, but then there's also cohort-based training if you're having a number of folks going through the same training program. Assignment-based project evaluation, we see that a lot in the IT industry. And then also discussion-based training is always good too, just where um, you know a, um, a dual trainee can um, kind of have a discussion with folks who are already in that position that they're training for to, um, you know, to talk about what they're learning and what questions they might have and really um, get more insight to that, how that those skills would really be utilized um, in that prospective job that they're training for. And so I will, um, oh, and I guess we have another slide here too. So um, you just wanna make sure that your on-the-job training plan includes one of the modes, at least one of the modes, maybe more than one. Um, the dual trainees need to earn their regular wages when they are doing on-the-job training. Um, instructors of related instruction uh, cannot also be, be OJT trainers. So for example, um, we always say to in within healthcare, the clinicals that are required, say of nursing students, um, even though they're at the employers, that cannot be considered the on-the-job training because clinicals are considered the education piece. So you want to definitely separate any education training from the on-the-job training. And, um, and like it says, OJT does not include related instruction coursework. Um, so you just want to make sure that um, that you're um, make sure you're doing both on the job training as well as um, the student is in their related education experience. And um, this is an example of an on the job training plan that you will put into your application. So you just and you don't need to, you don't have to, but um, we see that the reviewers really do appreciate it when there is some type of a plan so that, um, you know, you can put down the occupation the type of on-the-job training, so say job shadowing, the specific competencies, um, and you want to make sure that you have the pyramid right next to you when you are building your program so that you can, you know, really plug in those competencies that are on the pyramid into your on-the-job training plan. And you want to put the activity that will be performed so that um, they will be mastering that those specific skills. And then you would want to put the estimated number of hours um, that they will be doing that throughout the throughout the year. So, um, and again, that can be an approximate number, but um, you want to make sure that you're kind. Once you write up this plan, you, then then it's easy to actually have your program if you are awarded the grant because you have it all lined up already. So then it's just a matter of tracking to make sure that they complete that on the job training while they're in school. And if anyone has any questions, I sure can take those or else I can hand it back over to Grace or Jacqueline. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, and like Kathleen was saying, you can create your own on the job training plan. And these are just some headings to help get you started. Um, the pipeline program does also have some amazing templates on their website. Um, you can download those templates and they actually have various tabs on the bottom, a tab that's related instruction and all the skills. And then there's a tab for on the job training and all the skills. It essentially takes the competency model pyramid, puts it into an Excel workable format for you to assign to your trainees. So if you feel that that is a good resource, you are welcome to utilize that as well. And that could be your on-the-job training plan. 
but you might might also have your own way and style of creating an on the job training plan, which works as well. We're going to transition from eligibility into some competitive priorities and the collaboration with this proposal. So with priorities, first, the Office of Higher Ed prioritizes any of those applications that have continuing dual trainees. Since this is the first request for proposal, we're not going to have this scenario happen right now, but it's good to be mindful of it in the future. So if this year you have a trainee begin maybe a two-year program or a four-year program through this grant, please know that when you apply for the second request for proposal year that you will receive priority. We want to make sure we are awarding those applicants with continuing dual trainees first because we want them to succeed and complete their degrees. That's the overall goal of the program here. Then second, we do have a competitive priority for social equity applicants. So we will be prioritizing any of those applicants who have a social equity status. With the social equity applicant piece, um, this does apply to the applicant themselves as the business entity, but it also does apply to the dual trainees. And that piece may get a little difficult, especially if you haven't hired those trainees yet. Um, so what I would like to say is that whenever you are awarded a grant based on competitive priorities, if you are only awarded it because of these priority pieces, we will be working with you to make sure that your dual trainees meet these requirements. So if you are awarded a, based upon a social equity applicant status, and it is because you have indicated on your application that you are going to be having employees who meet these requirements, then we'll make sure that that actually happens and is carried out through the grant. Social equity applicants, that process is actually happening through the Minnesota Office of Cannabis Management. And you can see there's a variety of bullets on this slide that would actually give them the social equity applicant status, whether you're the business entity or it's your employees who will be dual trainees. And that process happens through Office of Cannabis Management. You indicate it on your application now, but then you have to go through those steps with cannabis management and we will follow up and check with them and make sure that that is in place. And then lastly, we go through all of the applications and we make sure that to the extent possible, we're balancing those awards among um, dual trainees that work inside and outside of the metropolitan areas, among the different industries and employer sizes. Then for collaboration, so we do allow some collaboration to happen while you're writing this proposal. Um, you may collaborate, of course, with the, the organization applying on behalf of cannabis employers. We'd want that organization collaborating with those cannabis employers because they do need to be identifying them at the time of proposal submission. And then also collaboration may happen between the training provider, the related instruction side, and the cannabis employers. And with that, though, we always do like to remind our applicants that it is the applicant themselves that is writing and submitting the proposal, that we can't have a training provider writing or submitting the proposal. Selection criteria. Okay, for selection criteria, this is the area in which you're going to be scored, and the score is really important. Um, these proposals are scored upon 100 points. The very first piece is half of those points. It's a, a total of 50 points. What we're looking at is making sure your dual training program is robust and complete. And in order to um, unpack how robust and complete it is, we want you to be hitting on these five different areas. So we want you to be writing out and discussing the related instruction competencies that are being learned. You're going back to that competency model pyramid. You're looking at those various tiers and you're pulling in those skills and letting us know related instruction has these variety of skills. Then you're going to unpack your on-the-job training. What is happening in that on-the-job training? What are those modes? And again, going back to the competency model, pulling in those skills and letting us know what are those on-the-job training skills that are going to be learned. And then we want to make sure all of those components are, they correlate well. It, it makes sense to have that type of related instruction with those type of on-the-job training um, tasks happening simultaneously. So you want to make sure that all of that's fitting together. And then we want to make sure 
it's it's really resulting in those industry um, recognized degree certificates and credentials in a timely fashion. What's that timeline? What are they earning? And then lastly, we want the applicant to let us know how they're planning to track all of this and evaluate that progress of their dual trainees. So you have all these pieces in place. How are you how are you tracking that and making sure it's happening? Then we are going to move into the next um, criteria for here. So you are going to go ahead and discuss the applicant's ability to recruit, train, and retain dual trainees who are recent high school graduates and or who have earned and passed their high school equivalency tests. So what is the work you are doing as an employer to help recruit dual trainees from this population? And similarly, what are you doing as an applicant that's demonstrating recruitment and training and retaining of dual trainees who are employees of color, American Indian employees, and employees with disabilities? What are those specific things that are happening as an employer that you're doing to reach out to those populations? Next, we're going to look at the direct costs of related instruction. So really focusing in on just tuition fees and books and materials. What is happening that is minimizing the cost for dual trainees? Do you have a program where the dual training grant is going to cover all those costs? Do you have a program where it's going to cover some of those costs, but your trainee is going to have access to federal and state financial aid programs to help assist with other costs? Do you have a program where the grant will cover some, but then you as an employer, you know, you're know, you stepping up above and beyond and you're like, we're going to regardless make sure this is all covered. You want to talk through that. And then for your dual trainees, what additional employment opportunities are they going to have after they complete this program? Within your organization, outside of your organization, what's that next step? What kind of doors are being opened for them? And then lastly, we want you to round out your proposal by discussing the projected increase in compensation that these trainees are going to have after doing this program. What is that compensation, those wage scales? Um, increases in wages are not required of a dual training grant for the legal cannabis industry, um, but it is part of the scoring process in what you're anticipating to happen. What is that likelihood and what is that compensation that's happening? You could also discuss in this sec in this section other types of comp um, compensation, like would it help them move to maybe a more desirable working shift? Would there be additional benefit opportunities? And you can unpack some of those other benefits that might happen as well. So the selection process and the various steps that happen is based upon those competitive priorities and that 100 point scale. So we organize those proposals so we can get all of the funds awarded that are available. Here are some really important um, timelines. So we're going to notify the applicants on August 6th of the award selection, whether they are or are not being awarded. Everybody will be notified on August 6th. And then right away, very quickly, we're going to notify the public on August 8th. And also on the same day, we're going to have a virtual orientation on August 8th from 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. I highly encourage you to just put a little placeholder on your calendar now for August 8th so you have that available. So as soon as you're awarded, you know you're already available to virtually join us for an orientation. We're going to work on getting documents prepared very quickly in August and contracts signed so your trainees can begin right there at the end of the month. Now what I'd like to do is we want to transition into that online proposal submission. I think it's really important to go ahead and see those screens and how you will actually apply for this grant. Everything is being done through um, an online type of a portal system. And you are going to need to register as a user. I'll show you where all that is. Here on the screen, you can just see an image of it, but you're going to register and it does take us a few days to get this approved. We need to make sure we look it over and assign you to the right group. So if you are thinking I'm an employer, I fit into this category, I'm planning to apply, please go ahead, get that registration done right away today, tomorrow, so we can get it approved for you. So you can at least get in the system and start things. You can save and come back and come in and out of this system as many times as you want. So it's great to at least get started. When you log into this system, um, you are going to go ahead and be initiating your proposal period. And this is that screen where you're going to actually create that proposal. 
And then all of the proposal content is due by July 22nd by noon. So it's during the business day by noon. Um, and then these are the various steps. So you that are in the proposal. You're gonna give us proposal information. You're gonna talk about the training providers and how you selected them. You're gonna write out that proposal narrative. That's those 100 points we talked about. And then there are gonna be some financial pieces on the, and the end piece that our team does need to review. So you are gonna have some pieces on there and you'll go ahead and submit all of that online. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen because we are gonna be jumping into a browser. And we're going to look at how you sign into all of this. All right. I want to start with the Office of Higher Education's website. So the Office of Higher Education has the dual training grant legal cannabis industry page dedicated to this program where it talks a bit about eligibility. We do have the request for proposal right here. Um, so when you click on it, it is gonna come up in this awesome PDF format. Let me just scroll to the top and so you can see it um, with those important dates. Please, please read this. Um, read this before you start that online process completely and before you're getting in and entering data. I wanna make sure you know all the details of this grant. And of course you can reach out to our team with any of those technical questions that you may have. And then right on that website is also the link to that online proposal submission process. And we have a couple steps that are detailed about registering and getting approved and getting into the system. So when you click on that link, you're brought out to this online submission um, proposal system. Um, very top right, you're gonna click sign in and you won't have an account yet. So you'll go over to the register tab and you're gonna go ahead and give us email address, username, password, and you are gonna confirm your password and it is gonna ask some additional questions. So let's do this. Click register. Oh, it wants more characters in there. Hold on. Okay, so then once you register, on that screen, it does want some more information before everything is actually approved in here. So we'll go ahead and we'll enter this information here. Um, organization name, this is your company name, you as the employer. So make sure you put this name in there because that helps me um, associate the various users with that organization. Okay, so everything is updated. Now I already um, have an account, so I'm gonna make sure I go and sign in as the actual account here. All right, so when I am logged into the account, so we'll go ahead and we'll approve that registration for you. Um, you will not, when you click on dual training grants up here, if you're not approved by us yet, you're not gonna see anything in this screen. Um, it'll say something like you don't have permission for that screen. As soon as we approve you though, you'll be able to click on dual training grants and you'll actually see this screen with this create button. And that is what you will go to. Again, we want to be, this is our employer name. And we are going into the legal cannabis application type. All right, so we've created the proposal, but now we need to edit it. We got to get into all those different screens. You'll come over to these three dots and you'll, um, you're left clicking actually, and then you'll just click edit. 
And just like the PowerPoint presentation, it showed these different screens, one, two, three, and four. There is not a way to navigate where you just jump to three, or if you're on four, you jump back to one. You actually do need to navigate that on the bottom by clicking like next and previous buttons. You can't unfortunately just click on the tab and it goes there. So proposal information. This is all of just the general information about you as an employer, what you're actually applying for. We want to know when your dual training grant program is starting. Um, so we know that the Minnesota State Colleges are going to be starting on the 26th. We know that um, the University of Minnesota will be starting on the 27th. Let us know when your program is going to be starting. It might be different, might be more of a customized schedule, and that is absolutely okay. You'll do your address. Um, so we need to know how you are operating legally in Minnesota. So remember we talked about a little bit earlier, the licensed cannabis businesses won't be in here yet, but if you're a registered medical um, cannabis manufacturer or the tribal sovereign nations, you'll go ahead and select that. Then you're gonna let us know if you are or are not paying the match. So if you're not gonna be paying the match because you're considered a smaller business, select no. And if you do select no, please know that you do need to upload a financial document showing 20 23 calendar year revenue. Again, calendar year, not fiscal year. With this, we're just going to select yes. We're going to say we're a large employer. We're paying that match. Um, is the applicant an employer or an organization representing employers? Most of the applicants are usually the employer themselves. Has the applicant been verified by Office of Canada? Canada's management as a social equity applicant. That process just became available within the last week. Um, but if you are planning to be applying for it and have that approved in the month of July, uh, make sure you select yes. So we know that. But if you're not planning to apply and don't meet the qualifications, go ahead and select no. So estimated number of trainees. This is an estimate. We just kind of want to know about how many trainees you plan to have in your program. We're going to say 10. This will be zero for everybody this year, but in future years, you may have some that are continuing. And then of those 10 dual trainees, how many are you anticipating will also be meeting that social equity applicant status? And so again, they have to apply officially through Office of Canada's Business Management. We'll say two. And then we need the breakdown um, of the, the funding that you're going to be requesting. So we have 10 dual trainees. Let's say we're going to do the maximum. Each trainee is going to have the $6,000. So we're going to request $60,000. And we do want to do the training support costs um, for this program. So we're going to do the maximum, which is the 10%. Please double check these amounts. This system is not going to automatically air out on maximums for you. So make sure you're double checking it. Our team will also check it for you and let you know if it's over. But we don't want you thinking, oh, I'm going to probably have this amount in my proposal. And then we come back to you weeks later and say, that was over maximum. So double check maximums in the request for proposal. And then we want to know who can we contact during this whole process this month on um, this application if we have any questions. So let us know exactly who we can reach out to. Okay, training provider criteria. I often get a lot of questions about this and how I like to explain it is typically in competitive grants after you've been awarded, you go through um, a bidding process for different services or goods. And we wanna make sure you have a competitive bidding process when you're getting in those goods and services. With dual training grant, it works a little bit differently. And so we have to do this process earlier. And so we have to do it right now in the proposal process. So we wanna know, when you're looking at training providers for your formal related instruction, what are you looking for in them? What, what's really important to you as an employer? Is the cost very important to you? You want it at a low cost. How about location? Easy, convenient to get to. Um, maybe you want the type of the delivery method. Maybe you only want an online program. So what are those things that are important to you as you're, you're looking for a training provider? And then we need to know which training providers you're reaching out to to learn about their programs and to potentially partner with, right? And you have to have a minimum of three. Now, state of Minnesota does have a targeted vendor list. 
post-secondary institutions typically aren't on this list. It's more of your private training providers that would be on these lists. But if you do select from the targeted training providers, you can just select them and put them in here. You don't have to do additional like calling and emailing with them, but it's rare that they come from the targeted vendor list. So typically, um, what you're going to do is you're going to re reach out to your various providers. So you're going to let us know the provider you reached out. We'll say this is College A. They're not on the list. Let's say they don't meet our criteria. We were emailing with them and we were doing that today. And we um, don't have any additional notes, but you can write additional notes in there if you'd like. Things that stood out to you, things you'd like to remember. And we're going to go over to College B. Now, they actually did meet those that criteria. They met that in-person learning maybe we were looking for. We reached out to them today as well. And then we need a third one in there. So we have College A and B. We want to get College C in there. Or it could be a private training provider. Let's do that instead. How about that? Private training provider. Okay. And let's say they were on the targeted vendor list. Um, we're just going to still, it's going to require you to put something in here, but we know that you didn't need to do that additional step. So if this is generic, that's okay. Targeted list. There we go. And we'll say they met it. Okay. All right. So we got at least three in here. You might have 10 in here but you at least have some. And these are the ones you're just, you're checking. You're just checking on making sure they're on here. Um, the ones you do select, they should definitely be on here because you should have checked with them, but you're gonna let us know in the next steps um, who you really did select. And then we need to know at least two people from the applicant need to be involved in this decision-making process. So you're gonna let us know um, who they are, and we just need to know the names and the titles of those individuals. Put that in there and good to go. We're moving forward to the next screen. All right, proposal narrative. We went over all these pieces in the PowerPoint presentation. So we talked about it. You are gonna put in the text. You're gonna put it here. Um, we have applicants who write several paragraphs. We have some who will use a Word document, maybe write out a page and copy and paste it. Just make sure it looks okay when it copies and pastes over into these areas. But you're going to answer each of those questions that we have already discussed. So I'm just going to put test in all of them so we can move the proposal forward. All right, and then down here, this is really important. We got uploads happening. Um, so what we need is we need a related instruction program summary. I need to know who you actually are selecting. Um, you will click on this link, and I recommend that you download this um, and not populate it in the online format, but download this Excel um, spreadsheet. And this is where you're going to let us know. This is the training provider I really chose. I'm going to choose College B. We're going to, it'll have, when you download this, it's going to have drop downs in here for you to select industry and occupation, and it'll filter everything out for you. We want to know the exact title of the degree. So write it all out, the title of that degree. And then we're going to ask about type. This again will also be a drop down. Letting us know if it's an academic degree or an industry certification. And then we need a link to that website. When I click on this link, I want to see it is an associates in horticulture management. Like I want to see that exact page that you've you've talked about here. I should be able to link directly to it. Okay. And you are going to upload that file. Also on this page, you are going to upload your on-the-job training plan. So again, one you're creating or maybe a template you're using from the Department of Labor and Industries Pipeline Program, but you have to upload that on-the-job training plan. And then you have an opportunity, if there's anything additional you'd like to upload, once in a while an applicant will upload maybe an image of the program, the Related Instruction Program, so we can more easily see the course breakdown or scheduling. When you are uploading documents and choosing files, and you're on this screen, you wanna make sure all your files are in one folder, and you can select them all at the same time. So when you click 
choose file. I don't know if you can fully see the box that I'm choosing, but I'm selecting two documents at the exact same time, and you can see it says two files on here. And then you can go to next. And it does take a few minutes for those files to actually show in that attachments area. And we are right at two o'clock. I do want to acknowledge that. We're going to keep going because we are recording. If you're able to continue staying with us, thank you so much. Our apologies for going over the time. Um, but if you do need to go, please know we will have this posted online as soon as we are able to. The last screen is our financial and applicant capacity review screens. We really want you to look at our request for proposal document and read through it because each type of applicant is going to have a little different requirements when it comes to this page. And I want to make sure you don't miss anything. So if we're in here and we're a business entity and you select business entity, we've got some bullets here on all the areas that you need to make sure you are um, addressing below. Um, nonprofits are a little bit different. And then, for example, if you're a tribal sovereign nation, it'll say right here you're not required and you can just move forward. So it's really important to make sure you're selecting the proper one and answering the questions appropriately. The first is capacity response. So we want you to go ahead and give us some details about your current staffing and organization structure and budget structure so we can determine just how you as an applicant, what your organization looks like. We want you to let us know if you've received any grants <clears throat> from our agency or any other state agency within the last five years. If you have, we've got an area for you to go ahead and add those grants in here so we can know exactly what they are. Let's say you had a dual training grant, which is a separate program, and you had it a few years ago. You can go ahead and add that in there. And you'll see that listed then. We want to, um, we need to go into the certification of no felony financial crimes. So for your organization that's going to be working with this grant, you're certifying that nobody has a felony financial crime, and it's specific to this financial piece. You'll go ahead and you're going to do an electronic signature on here. And with that certificate of no financial felony crime, you do also have to upload. So we want an upload of like a map or a list of those organization staff members that you're certifying also do not have these felony financial crimes. And that'll be at the bottom of the screen. You're going to let us know that you're in good standing with the Secretary of State. You can do no or yes, and we do always verify this. And then our business entities and our nonprofits, they do need to be uploading additional financial documents. If this is a grant request below the $50,000 marker, we only need to be looking at the last year in which the taxes and audits were completed. If this is a request of $50,000 or higher, then we do need the um, last three years that have been completed for taxes and audits. Again, read the request for proposal so you know exactly which documents we're looking for. You can select this box to let us know. If it's at if it's below or above that fifty thousand, and it'll just remind you of most completed year or three completed years. And then we have additional questions for those business entities. Um, are there any liens on assets, and then any bankruptcy proceedings? So go ahead and answer those. And then again, make sure you do upload those documents. Oh, it wants me to answer a couple of things. Hold on. To make sure so we can move forward. Okay, and then it's submitted. And so you'll get this confirmation screen. The system does not send an email to you saying it's completed, but it will send you this screen. And then if you go back to dual training grants and you can see it's here, you can see it's in a submitted status. You are able to click on edit, but you can't edit. So I can't change this anymore or manipulate it, but I still have access to it. If something is 
if there's an error or something is wrong, please reach out to our team directly. We do have the ability to do a manual update on the back end. And then when we say that manual update, you would still be able to come back into the system and see that change live. So let's say, for example, things need to change on whether you're paying the match or not paying the match. We do have the ability to change that on the back end. So then you can see the change on here as well. And so you'll continue to have access to your proposal throughout this process, which is great. And then you can you know, save these screens so you have all that content. Okay. We're going to go back into the PowerPoint presentation, and Grace is going to just help us wrap it up with a couple high points of grantee planning, but we should just be done here in one to two minutes. And if you have any questions, you are welcome to ask. Yes. Wonderful. So um, we mentioned the orientation a little bit earlier, but it, it, we are going to be hosting, or I should say the Office of Higher Ed is going to be hosting um, a mandatory orientation on August 8th from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper um, in what's coming up. And um, yeah, let's so so these are the few uh, are the things that we're going to discuss at that time a work plan and budget related instruction agreement the training participation agreement financial applications or financial aid applications expenditures business with the state and grant contracts and then um with the office of grant management policy uh, Jacqueline and I, uh, OHI will process payment requests through a method of reimbursement and all grantee requests for reimbursement must correspond with the approved grant budget and we'll touch on that a little bit more as well at orientation. And then there is required grant reporting um, through the life of this grant and there's going to be two different progress reports that are required during the contract period in February 2025 and September of 2025. And then grant monitoring is also a requirement for grantees with awards of $50,000 or higher. Um, and really important, oh, should I mention that? <laughs> really important grant reimbursement and future dual training grant legal canvas proposal eligibility is contingent upon fulfilling the reporting requirements. So you need to follow uh, the rules that are established by the grant. And now we'll open it up for questions. That was a lot of information. So I'll stop sharing the screen so it's easier for me to see chat if you put anything into the chat. Otherwise, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask questions as well. <laughs> 